My name is Nicole Zuckerman. I work at Clover Health. We're a health insurance company that's focused on using data and empathy to get better health outcomes for our members, a large proportion of whom are minorities or have low incomes and are um, on average like above 65. So as such, we're pretty clearly invested in data and um, even for us, the struggle to get actionable data about diversity and inclusion at our company is real. But we've worked really hard at it, and so there's some uh, things that are worth sharing so that folks at other organizations can benefit from the work we've done. So I want to spread that around so that more companies are doing it. The fact that tech is struggling to hire or retain employees from diverse backgrounds has been written about and discussed thoroughly, particularly in the last few years. The economic, social, and moral benefits of diversity are also well documented. So then why is it hard for well-intentioned organizations to shift their demographics? There are a number of reasons, but one that doesn't appear to have been discussed as thoroughly is the challenge of gathering and responding to data about diversity within a company's hiring pool and existing employees. So we're going to run through some of the challenges that I've seen. This is not an exhaustive list. You may have more, in which case I'm interested to hear what your struggles are. But one, those who are interested might not be the ones who have access to data. So those who are driven to do something about it might not be your engineers or data scientists. The data is really sensitive, turns out. Um, can you imagine that? The data is uh, siloed into different systems that don't interact. If you use some like application tracking system and then you have some internal platform for managing employee information, those don't necessarily talk to each other very well. It's also hard to even agree on what to ask people about their uh, data. And also the data tends to be pretty sparse when you're dealing with um, asking candidates for um, their race or their gender. All right, so how do we get around those? I know I just blazed through a lot of problems in a very small amount of time, but my interest lies mostly in sharing solutions that have worked, so let's go there. And uh, full disclosure, I'd like to say that what follows is an exhaustive study of what organizations do across tech and beyond, but all I have to share with you is what I've learned while working at Clover Health and a few other companies, and what I've gotten from talking to others who are similarly invested in the topic. So if you know of strategies and, that have worked for you or someone you know, let's find a place to share those and at me on Twitter so that I get to know about them too, yeah? So one thing that we did to solve this is we had people who have the interest and the people who have the technical skills in one place. And actually, we kind of just lucked into this. We happen to have a high proportion of engineers in our diversity and inclusion work group. This was not intentional, though. The engineers just happen to be ones invested in pushing this forward. So we helped create employee surveys and analyze the results. Um, for a hack day project, I created a Python web application to ingest information about the diversity in the various stages of our candidate pool. We also got HR and PR engineering and um, our diversity inclusion manager in the same room, depending on the problem, to talk about the needs and the outcomes and the risks. So doing problem solving without having all these stakeholders in one place would have been a huge mistake. Because you can't just like give an engineer a spec and say, like, go build this thing, because they probably have a lot of opinions on like the design of the system and the security implications of the data that you're trying to collect. But similarly, you, an engineer can't keep track of all the HR and PR repercussions or like all the potential ramifications of collecting the data. So it really takes a village. Getting those people together is vitally important. So since the data is sensitive, we do our darndest to protect it. We protect the data from our candidates. We protect the data from our employees. But like how, right? One way can, we can do this is to outsource with companies like CultureAmp or Namely or Atypica. These companies all have permission controls to limit exposure of data. It's entirely possible to do this in-house, like I did with my Hack Day project. It's just harder to take care of all the edge cases and make sure it's all cool. So our first attempt to programmatically track diversity in candidates was this Hack Day project that I mentioned, uh, consuming an external API that had our uh, job candidates data. And this was totally doable once we thought through the ramifications. 
But other companies like literally have this as their main product. So depending on the size of your team, it might make sense to outsource having to deal with like safety concerns of data. Another thing that we did that is vitally important is anonymizing. We anonymize our data when we pull together information about candidates using the API. For example, we just didn't store anything that was personally identifiable. We had their candidate ID and we had their, um, their gender and their race and things like that, but we didn't store their name or anything, any place anyone could find it. Um, we also limited candidate data to those who have left the funnel already. So once you've exited the candidate pool, either you've been hired or you withdrew from the process or we didn't choose to hire you, then your data would come into this uh, pipeline. Because if you're currently in the funnel already and some hiring manager is looking at this stuff, um, we don't want them to be able to see candidates that we're evaluating and go, oh, we need more veterans to increase our diversity for this year. We should totally hire this person. Because it turns out that that's as illegal as, uh, as not hiring someone because they're from one of those groups, right? And this is just like a little note from me to you. Um, put your API keys in a private place that's not even accessible to all of engineering because this holds information about like your potential future coworkers or yourself and it's generally not a good idea to be able to like look up and see the like scores from the interview for your coworker that's like kind of not cool so just keep that in mind and so anything that has like an API key that's accessible to all of engineering you, all your data is accessible to all of engineering Okay, so <laughs> I love the Muppets. Um, one other thing that we did was deciding to show results only for groups of a minimum pool size or greater, even if that means that we get data on a slower cadence, in order to give the pool size a chance to get large enough for real anonymity. Beware of combinations. Veterans, people with disabilities, people of a gender or a certain race combination are identifiable even without anonymity. So we decided not to show slices of like the combination of these things at the same time, unless that slice fit or exceeded our minimum pool size for this reason. So there's a number of musicians who are on The Muppet Show. There's also a number of blue Muppets on The Muppet Show. If you want to know how many musicians who are also blue, it's just that one guy. So. You know, if this were our hiring pipeline, it could be like, oh, our blue mu musicians, I know who we're talking about. And that's not ideal, yeah. Okay, so um, one other thing that we did is we tried to combine the siloed data. So tools like Greenhouse, CultureAmp, and Namely don't integrate easily for us to get a coherent story. And we're a healthcare company, and it's kind of our business to integrate disparate data sources. And it's still challenging for us. This is not a thing that we've solved with technology at this point, because at the scale that we are, it's totally doable for humans to do the work of putting the picture together. It's not super necessary to have an engineering solution right now. Um, but depending on the size of your organization, that might be something that you want to do. This might be helped by developing your own internal models for data. But again, be careful of the sensitivity of it. We also debated what information we could, should even collect. We have to be really careful collecting data that is legal. We can't ask candidates certain questions by law, even if you have the best of intentions. You can't ask, like, how old are you? Because we know that we tend to skew young and we want to have more older people in our organization. That's totally illegal. We need to also decide what labels and groups to include, like for a gender question, what will our options be? Will we have non-binary options? What do we call the groups? Making a survey is an art unto itself, and it's possible to ask questions and elicit a response that the asker did not intend. So for this one, it's really useful to have people in, uh, who are invested in this process who know how to do that stuff, right? Get your like UX designers in there too. Also, federal contractors, like Medicare insurance companies, have EEOC requirements, that's Equal Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and they require that we ask 
certain questions. But the questions and the answers that they make us ask don't necessarily match up with what we'd like to ask. And so that leads to us having multiple surveys, which causes survey fatigue and suspicion. So for example, the EEOC has like two gender options. There's only male, female. And Clover Health knows that there's non-binary people out there, and we want to give them a gender option that like represents them. But we also have to just like ask what the EEOC tells us to. So the data that we get is often sparse. And understanding what makes that data sparse has a lot to do with humans. Solutions are usually specific to a particular group. For our purposes, we have some tools that have worked for employees at Clover and other strategies that were helpful with dealing with candidate data. Now, when I say sparse, I mean like you might get 100 applications and only 20 of them filled out any of the questions. And of them, maybe some of them only filled out some of the questions. So here were some of the things that we struggled with and solved with employee data. Employees are the ones who tend to develop survey fatigue over time, when there's too many surveys in a given time period to solicit different information from them. So let's say you have like a weekly, like how do you feel about working here survey, and you also have this um, diversity survey to figure out what the makeup of the employee base is, and then you also have your like team survey, what do you think of your manager and stuff, that can get really exhausting and then people are like, ah, screw it, I'm just not gonna fill out any of them. So my recommendation for this is kind of just be mindful about it, try to time things well so that people aren't just hit with them over and over and over, and also figure out a cadence that is reasonable. Employees are also often ambivalent about the value of providing the data in the first place and convincing them otherwise can sometimes be a challenge. So tell them why the information is important to you. We've also conducted campaigns like giving project stickers as a carrot to incentivize you filling out this thing. And it's a tiny thing, right? Like a project sticker is a tiny incentive and yet it works. Or like a piece of chocolate. People will jump through hoops for a piece of chocolate. Um, and also, since you can't submit null data to the government, HR, if you're one of these companies that has to do the EEOC data, um, HR will visually select gender and race for anyone who doesn't fill out their information if you have these EEOC requirements. So once people know that someone's going to attest for them, they're more likely to attest themselves just to make sure the data about them is more accurate. Because there's a lot you can't tell about someone just by looking at them. Who knew? So with candidate data, it's like a whole different kettle of chips. Sometimes there's just no opportunity to collect data from system inputs. Like if you have sourced candidates or referrals that don't go through the normal like career page that you have for your organization. So what can you do about it? And there's kind of only two ways to deal with this. One is either you make everyone go through the same process and go through the careers page or you tell your recruiters and make sure that your um, referral path also tries to collect this information. Also, folks who don't work for you are often suspicious of what you're gonna do with their information. Will it be used against them in some way? And the best thing I can say about this is having a little blurb when you're collecting the information saying like, these are the reasons we're collecting it, we're gonna like protect your data and not use it for nefarious purposes. And even just acknowledging that you're asking them to give them something that is like a little risky for them will often extend some of that trust that you need to get it in the first place. So this problem is one of people and systems, which is why it's hard. Computers are way easier than humans. Um, it's especially challenging if you're a person who's like at the apex of privilege in our society, but like do what you can. From this little perfectionist heart to yours, let me remind you, admit that you're not gonna have it perfect, but that having something even if it's not perfect, is better than not trying anything. Try to build process around data collection whenever you can. Show how bad the data is to your employees to convince them to buy in. 
I don't know about your coworkers, but with mine anyway, there is like no better way to motivate them than to be like, wow, we're really bad at this thing, y'all. And I highly recommend you don't guess about people unless required to by law if you have those EEOC requirements. Or if you're going to do it, outsource to a company that does it professionally, they're less likely to be um, biased than a human is, or at least they're more likely to do it consistently, yeah. And if you are at the apex of privilege, cishet white men, you should involve people from underrepresented groups in the process. Listen to them. They know how things are going to come across to other people from underrepresented groups. But don't make them do the lion's share of the work. My personal recommendation is to solicit their opinion early and often, do some work, show them what you did, and ask for feedback. And then they're looped in without having to like, carry this whole burden of representing all the diverse people on their backs. All right, so here's where I show you some options. Here are some real world examples of what you can do to get started. They go from least to greatest time investment. This one takes very little work. Culture Amp does all of it for you. There are probably other survey tools out there. This is just the one that I've seen used at the places that I've worked. This is also the thing that people do the most frequently serving their employees a captive audience to figure out how diverse their workforce actually is. They have this diversity and inclusion survey that you can use right out of the box if you want to, or you can fine tune it and customize it. But if you're sitting there wondering, how can I get a pretty good return on very little investment, or what is the least work I can do, here's a good starting point. Here's the like mama bear, the middle level of difficulty of stuff. Get a CSV and do some Excel magic. This takes slightly more work. After all, where do you get the data for this CSV? You can probably get it through reporting with some of the candidate tracking systems you use. This is an Excel doc of a data dump from a third party tool <clears throat> that allows me to slice our data as I see fit. In this case, looking only at roles that have engineer in the title, looking at the recruiter resume screen review stage, and getting the pass-through rate for men versus women at this stage. Check out that formula. I haven't used Excel for formulas in many years, but it got me the information I needed to make informed decisions as gnarly as it is. I'm actually kind of proud of it. <laughs> Excel, who knew I was ever going to need that as an engineer? <laughs> OK, so this is the like big, taking a bigger bite off of the problem. So I put together, as I said, this web app uh, for a Hack Day project um, in an hour and a half around a year ago. I was involved in too many projects over Hack Days, wanted to help everyone. And then the one I was most excited about was this one, but I was doing it on my own. So of course, it fell to the bottom of the priority list. And I ended up only having like an hour and a half to work on it. So the front end literally had no styles on it. It was bare bones as can be, but it worked. This would have been a fairly large investment of engineering time to make this like safe and production ready because of the data. Um, but if you work in a relatively large company, it might actually be worth it. And honestly, the base case didn't take that much work. So here we go. <sighs> Here's my glorious hacky hack day code. And in prod, this would never fly with that like nested for loop. The performance is terrible, but as a proof of concept, it was really effective to give the people a chance to see how homogenous or diverse our candidate pool really was for any given role. So this is the one Django view that I have for this project. It gets a list of jobs. It gets all the applications for each job, and then gets the EEOC data associated with each application. It does a little number smushing, renders a list of jobs, with data about how diverse the candidate pool is for each of those roles. The API calls aren't very fancy. There's just some hard-coded URLs. I hit Greenhouse's API. I load the data from each of these three endpoints. And so here's where I actually add the application status to the dictionary for this job. I get gender. I get veteran status, I get disability status, 
Those are relatively simple because they're binary. And race was a slightly more complicated, looks a little gnarlier, but like, this is pretty simple stuff that you can probably write fresh out of boot camp or college. So those are some ways that you can solve these problems and here, like, take these and run with them. But also, there's a ton of other things you can do to instrument your hiring pipeline or measure changes in inclusion at your company. So I would love it if everyone shared out what worked for you, what didn't work for you, so we as a community can learn from each other and develop some best practices. There's no reason to keep the best practices about diversity and inclusion secret. I want this special sauce like all over tech. So this is me. Oh no, that's so pixelated. That's my dog. She's actually super duper cute and you should follow her on Instagram. Her name is Chloe and at Instagram she's a corgi in the front. And, uh, oh, that's all little pixelated, but she's really cute. I work at Clover Health. Come work with me, we're hiring. CloverHealth.com careers. And I promise we like care about diversity and stuff at our company, right? Is it, so, is it here in New York? Yeah, Clover Health has engineering in Jersey City. It's at Exchange Place, like one stop on, on the path train over the water. It takes like seven minutes to get from World Trade Center. Um, so I think we have time for questions, yeah? So if you want to, I'm here. Yes? I have question. How long have you been programming in Python for? The question was, how long have I been programming in Python? The answer is since 2012? Oh, wow. Six years. Six years? Yeah. So, you know, not that long in the span of my life, but like, it's my favorite language. I love it to death. You know, I just got into um, Python as well. Um, I'm currently a junior at the College of Staten Island, and I was, I was forced to do C++, and then I taught myself Python. Right now, I'm taking a Udemy course on Django, and I'm just loving it. I wish they could be teaching that as the assignment instead of C++. Yeah. Um, if you are also going through school for computer science or something, obviously you're here. You know that Python is great. Django is a tool that I came around to after being like, I don't want all the bells and whistles. And then I was like, damn, that ORM is so good. Any questions? OK, well, seriously, follow my dog on Instagram. She is the cutest thing you've ever seen. Thank you all. I'm sorry, I got one more question. We can do it over.